Oh. Yep, sounds good. Bye. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman here in our Northwest Side studio. And I'm Paris Just reporting live from Northwest Suburban Elgin. On the show tonight, the Chicago Public School Board votes whether to keep police in schools. The search for a COVID-19 vaccine. A report on banks lending mostly to predominantly white Chicago neighborhoods. Art activism as seen on boarded up buildings throughout the city and a teenage mariachi group that recorded an album during the pandemic. First, Brandis, I am co-anchoring tonight from Elgin. This northwest suburban city of about 115,000 is dealing this evening with some unrest over police and community issues as it prepares for phase four of COVID-19 reopening. So we'll have the very latest on all of those things in just a bit, but first back to you for the latest developments from today. Paris, thanks, we'll see you soon. Residents in more Chicago neighborhoods will be able to dine outdoors this weekend as the city closes off more streets to let restaurants spread out. The city says the pilot program will expand to neighborhoods including Andersonville, Chinatown, Little Italy, Edison Park and Grand Crossing. Neighbors in Lakeview, Gold Coast and Heart of Italy already have access to outdoor dining. Restaurants and bars can reopen indoor dining services on Friday, but must limit their capacity to 50 people. Illinois blood banks are at critically low levels. The Illinois Coalition of Community Blood Centers says the COVID-19 pandemic has led to massive cancellations of blood drives, leading to a nearly 60% drop in donations. Since March, about 70 to 80% of blood drives have been canceled. However, the coalition and the Red Cross are still taking donors, requiring masks, social distancing, and appointments. Visit our website for more on this story, including how to schedule an appointment. The Trump administration is ending funding for 13 COVID-19 testing sites across the country, including, including two here in Illinois. The Illinois Department of Public Health tells Crane Chicago Business that it requested an extension of the funding but was denied. Meanwhile, state health officials also report another 64 people have died from the coronavirus. The state now has more than 6,700 deaths. There are around 700 newly reported cases, bringing the total statewide to more than 138,000. And while fireworks seem to have been set off all over the city this past weekend, or this past week, the summer tradition will not be taking place at one iconic attraction. Navy Pier's annual 4th of July fireworks display is canceled to prevent a large gathering of people. Instead, the city will present a number of alternative events on the 4th, including the Chosen Few DJ's annual house music festival going virtual. More details are on our website at WTTW.com news. Barring any last minute change of plans, communities throughout Illinois will move on to phase four of reopening Friday. That means limited capacity will be allowed for dine in at restaurants and other indoor activities. Paris Schutz and producer Quinn Myers ventured out to far northwest suburban Elgin today to get the lowdown on how that community has coped with the COVID-19 pandemic and shutdown. At the same time, Elgin is facing civil unrest of its own over a police involved shooting. Paris Schutz joins us now from downtown Elgin with the latest Paris. 
Hey, Brandis, as we join you from the Fox River here in Elgin, the city's mayor and city council are in a meeting right now as Elgin prepares for phase four of COVID-19 reopening on Friday. And just before this meeting, a couple hours ago, a few dozen protesters demonstrated outside the municipal building. They're demanding the city take action on a 2018 police-involved shooting. Now, this incident happened when police lieutenant Chris Jensen, a white police officer, shot and killed an African-American woman, the Cynthia Clemens, after a standoff on the I-90 highway. Now, Jensen was reinstated to the force last year after multiple investigations, including from an outside security firm that Elgin contracted with, found no basis for any criminal charges. But protesters believe the killing was unjustified, and they are asking city council to remove him from the force. Everyone has their opinion to it, and the city found that. They found that group. They didn't ask a group of us civilians or citizens to go out there and do our research and homework and find the group that we're comfortable with to go in there and ask the questions that we want to ask. Those questions are already made up just for that. We don't know what goes on behind those closed doors. We never will until we actually do this or we get in there and we show our faces. We'll have the reaction on this from Elgin's mayor a little later on. Meanwhile, Elgin prepares for phase four of reopening on Friday as restaurants downtown have sprung to life with outdoor dining. Now, Elgin is a blue collar, diverse city of about 115,000 residents, half of which are African American and Hispanic Latino. It's home to many mid sized manufacturing companies, nine retail malls, and thousands of small businesses. One of the largest employers here is the Grand Victoria Casino, which sits on the Fox River. It has been fully closed since mid-March, and like other casinos, will be allowed to reopen, we think, at some point during Phase 4. But state leaders and the Illinois Gaming Board are still determining when that's going to be and what the regulations are going to be. Now, the casino provides about $12 million in tax revenue each year to the city and hundreds of jobs, all sorely missed right now. They're a large employer in the community and our top 10 list of large employers. And so the impact of not having them here, not having them come out to lunch and, and buy lunch in, in the downtown area or throughout the area, the folks who are coming from all over the state to be on the boat, that's a significant impact to the community. But the town's chamber does note that Elgin is a diversified economy and many businesses were allowed to stay open as essential business throughout the shutdown. Now, Elle's uh, Cafe and Creamery is a local staple here downtown that says that the new outdoor regulations have allowed it to recover about 80% of its normal revenue. So the restaurant is doing that by staggering reservations outdoors throughout the day. Before I was uh, first come for a surf, nobody reservations, and now we stack the reservations in such a way that we still do quite a, a, a lot of business. And uh, so, even though we have only 40% uh, capacity of seating, you know, we do about 80% of the business that we normally do. Elgin is also home to the Elgin Symphony, which is determining right now how it plans to move forward with limited indoor capacity following the lead of the CSO and other symphonies around the country, trying to see what they're going to do. Still being worked out, whether that means concerts for 50 people in attendance while hundreds more pay to stream online, or whether that includes outdoor concerts. It's a community of 110,000 people, and it's, it's economic and racial diversity makes it just a, a, unlike a lot of communities that support an orchestra of our size. Um, that is uh, a huge asset for us because we are able to bring the community together in a different way. We're able to be true economic and social advocates for, for our community in a way that, you know, that orchestras in, in wealthier communities and less diverse communities aren't able to, to offer that kind of support to their audiences. Meanwhile, this community has been hit harder with COVID-19 than other communities in this region. More than 2,000 confirmed cases in the three zip codes that make up Elgin, South Elgin, and some of the surrounding metro area. Now, the Greater Elgin Family Care Center has been conducting testing since April. They're reporting that the positivity rate in Hispanic Latinos is a whopping 85%. 85% of tests coming back positive in that community as opposed to 15% for non-Hispanics. So a very significant disparity. And that's not surprising to us, um, knowing the community as we do. Um, we know that there's a lot of families that are, you know, for a bunch of reasons, living in multi-generational households, working in service industries. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors that goes into that. 
So a lot of issues being sussed out here in Elgin, just like Chicago, only on a smaller scale. And we'll be back with a lot more on all of those in a bit. But Brandis, we toss it back to you. Well, Paris, that Al's is able to recover 80% of its revenue the way it's uh, stacking the reservations. That's pretty impressive. Thank you. Chicago's school board has rejected a measure that would have removed police officers from the city schools. The vote was close, though, and the issue is expected to pop up again. Amanda Vinicky joins us with more. Amanda, what happened today? Well, Brandis, the vote was as close as it could have been, 4-3 to three against terminating Chicago Public Schools' $33 million contract with the Chicago Police Department to provide officers to schools. Well, some activists and groups have long said that schools are no place for the police. This issue has really gained momentum since the killing of George Floyd and the national Black Lives Matter movement that his death triggered, including fresh marches today that saw a coalition of progressive organizations, including the Chicago Teachers Union, taking to the streets, specifically at Federal Plaza, also outside of school board president Miguel Del Valle's home. Critics point to statistics that show black students, also those with learning issues that require individual education plans, as far more likely to have an encounter with a school-based police officer known as a SRO. They say that SROs put black children on a school to prison rather than a school to college pipeline. We can create interventions. We can create the ability to empower our teachers to have trainings to de-escalate, as opposed to saying, hey, I need a police officer to come into my classroom to de-escalate a student. Why is the criminalization of black and brown youth a priority for the city of Chicago, but educating them is not a priority? Rod Wilson says he wants Chicago to come out of this pandemic as a stronger community. He says that means putting that $33 million to better use than threatening and harming children, such as last January, when Lorenzen Howard says police dragged his 16-year-old daughter down two flights of stairs at Marshall Metropolitan High School and tased her. He says she's been in counseling since that attack. She wakes up screaming in the middle of the night. She wakes up crying to me, and um, we talk every day about the situation. And she always asks me, Dad, they were supposed to protect me. Why were they beating me like that? Now, school board president Miguel Del Valle says students can also experience physical and psychological trauma if there are no police to protect them. Just before the vote this afternoon on a Zoom meeting, of course, he shared that 51 years later, he is still scarred from what happened to him when he was a CPS student. I remember being beaten by gang members, and this was in eighth grade, in the basement of a school and having no one come to my assistance. And Del Valle says that he believes that the CPS board does need to take it utmost of concern, the safety of its students. I don't want a police officer with complaints filed against them in our schools. Under no conditions do I want that. But I ask all the organizers to come out to the communities and find ways, in addition to working on this issue and working directly with local schools on this issue, and I welcome that, I also ask them to work on a plan to reduce the level of violence. 106 shootings, 14 killings. Now, that was a reference to the heightened violence that Chicago saw this past weekend. Del Valle, by the way, appointed to his position as head of the board by Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot. His position dovetails with CPS's and with its CEO, Janice Jackson's. For many of our students in, in, in the communities that they live in, the school is oftentimes the most safe place for them outside of their homes. As we put our safety plans together as a district, we know that we have to get this right, not just because it's our job, but because we are literally making life or death decisions every single day for our kids. Jackson says CPS will play a critical role in dismantling institutional racism. She says the district has already taken steps to make sure that student resources officers are better trained and that they do not have a role in actually disciplining students. She says on this matter of safety, she doesn't want to take a rush and a top-down approach. Rather, she says whether particular schools should have 
school resource officers should be left to their local school councils. Now, the mayor sponsor, or the motion sponsor that is, says her action is anything but rash or reckless. It is not a conclusion that I came to because I am or was overly emotional or because I cater solely to loud voices. This is an evidence-based conclusion informed by decades of research and listening to the voices and organizing of black and brown young people in this city. Now, CPS's contract with the police department actually ends while students are on their summer break now. So the board is going to have to vote on a new contract next month or in August. There is a whole lot more to this. The school board meeting lasted nearly six hours. And for a detailed, detailed recap of all that went on to see how board members voted as well, you can check out our website for WTTW news reporter Matt Masterson's story. That's on WTTW.com slash news. Brandis, back to you. Yeah, and Amanda, the, the breakdown of that vote is actually pretty interesting. Um, thank you, Amanda. We'll see you soon. Uh, stick around for Spotlight Politics. That's going to be later on in the program to hear how some local aldermen weighed in. Up next, the search for a COVID-19 vaccine. But first, a look at the weather. <laughs> Teams around the globe are racing to develop an effective vaccine or treatment for COVID-19. The fastest a vaccine has ever been developed was for mumps, and that took four years. But with 26 states now reporting coronavirus cases on the rise and a U.S. death toll of more than 120,000, hopes are high for a safe and effective, effective vaccine or treatment as soon as possible. Joining us to share his insight is Dr. Robert Murphy, Professor of Infectious Diseases at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine and also Executive Director of the Institute for Global Health. Dr. Murphy, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So first, how does a vaccine work and do all vaccines work the same way? Um, vaccines work by presenting the body with a piece of the virus or in, uh, an altered virus that doesn't replicate. And then the immune system recognizes it as the real thing and uh, makes antibodies and other protective uh, things against that virus that protect you from getting the real thing. So there's many ways to make these viruses. Um, you know, seven or eight uh, are commercially uh, available now. They each have their different uh, manufacturing uh, type ways. Some are better than others. Uh, and uh, there's like 200 of them in development right now, and 13 have actually gone into humans. So uh, yesterday, the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Fauci, said that he was optimistic that a vaccine could be developed by the end of this year or early next year. Um, here's a little of what he said about the effort to accelerate the development of the vaccine. We are taking financial risks, not risks to safety, not risk to the integrity of the science so that when, and I believe it will be when and not if, we get favorable candidates with good results, we will be able to make them available to the American public, as I said to this committee months ago, within a year from when we started. Now, typically it takes most vaccines, most vaccines, about 10 years to develop before they are widely available. So is it possible to really accelerate the process for this virus or for this vaccine and still be certain that it is safe and effective? Yes, uh, the technology has advanced enough that uh, the vaccines can be developed much quicker. Uh, and what uh, Dr. Fauci was just talking about uh, how they're investing all this money now and the uh, resources and that they're actually building the plants and starting to manufacture the virus before it's been proved to be safe or effective. This is gonna cost many, many, many millions of dollars. Nobody would ever do this before, but we're in the middle of a pandemic. And what he's saying is they're willing to just throw that all away if, this, if that vaccine product doesn't work. Because each vaccine is gonna be like in a different sort of manufacturing facility. So if they get to the point where the studies are done and it doesn't work, they just abandon all that investment. 
Okay, so there are reportedly more than 100 vaccine candidates, candidates alone being worked on around the world right now. 200. 200, thank you so much, because um, <laughs> we've, we've heard some stories of apparent breakthroughs. Um, how would you assess, you know, the status and where we are in the search for a viable vaccine? Well, you start with the preclinical, uh, you know, you give it to animals uh, uh, and uh, stuff. And then you go into humans um, as a single doses, low doses, you increase. There are three different phases of development. In the second phase, you figure out the dosing, if you have to give a booster, whatever. Uh, and then when it gets to phase three, that's when you're comparing your ideal vaccine product that's gonna go into the market if this uh, thing works and you compare it against placebo, which is the standard of care because there's no other treatment. Uh, and that takes thousands of patients. And, but because the coronavirus infection is short, the incubation period is short, all that can be compressed. Uh, the Oxford group uh, thinks that they may have a vaccine available actually in September of this year. Now, just being available doesn't mean it's gonna be worldwide available, but available to at least tens of thousands of people, if it works. If it works. So does a vaccine have to be 100% effective to stop the spread of COVID-19? And does everybody have to get it? Or how many people do have to have that vaccine? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I think what you're getting at is a, a thing called herd immunity. If you vaccinate enough of the people, you actually will eliminate the virus. You'll change the R not factor, which is the number of people that get infected uh, from one particular person. Once that goes below one, the, the whole epidemic basically begins to go away. And that's the goal. So we don't know what that percentage is. With measles, it's quite high. With the, uh, the flu, you know, we're talking in the 90%, 80, 90% range. When you start dip, dipping below that, there's still enough people at risk to keep the virus uh, floating around. But so it depends. Okay, so here's what President Trump said uh, about the search for a vaccine back in March. Okay. Want to see if we can do that very quickly. We're looking to uh, when I say quickly, we're looking to get it by the end of the year if we can, maybe before we're doing tremendously well. What do you think about the president's assessment at the time? Well, you, you know, his, uh, his assessment is wishful thinking. Uh, he doesn't understand how a vaccine is developed, and he doesn't necessarily listen to his advisors. What is true, though, and what Dr. Fauci also said, I believe what Dr. Fauci says, is that there will be a vaccine candidate ready by the end of this year. Now, be ready does not mean available on the market. Uh, so more like one year from the, the start of the development. So in first quarter of 21, most likely. So that means the rest of us won't be getting it probably until, as you said, first quarter of 21 or even later. Uh, no, we wouldn't be getting it until probably later in 21 because say you want to vaccinate everybody that wants to get vaccinated, which is another issue altogether. Uh, you know, to manufacture all that, now granted they're manufacturing the stuff as we uh, speak, you know, th which they may have to throw away if it doesn't work. But um, if all that is ready to go, still to deliver, say 300, say 250 million people are willing to take the vaccine or 300 million people. It would take some time. How do you deliver 300 million doses? How do you even <laughs> deliver 300 million, people. you know? Absolutely. We're in Illinois. Uh, I'm sure, million, you know, I'm sure uh, we'll have you back to discuss it uh, as we yeah. learn more and more. My thanks to Dr. Robert Murphy for joining us. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Still to come. Still to come on Chicago Tonight. The disparity of home lending in Chicago neighborhoods. We are literally making life or death decisions every single day for our kids. More on the vote to keep police in Chicago public schools in tonight's Spotlight Politics. How one organization is taking up the cause to beautify boarded up buildings across Chicago. And meet a teenage mariachi group that recorded an album during the pandemic. But first, we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring from Northwest Suburban Elgin, Paris. Yeah, Brandis, we're joined right now by Illinois State Senator Christina Castro, whose district includes a lot of Elgin and South Elgin. Thank you so much for being here on the beautiful Fox River with us. Um, you heard the numbers before, 85% of Hispanic Latinos being tested with the nasal swab test at the Greater Elgin Family Care Center. 
are testing positive. What do you make of that? I mean, that's part of one of the things that we've been talking about. I've been a, a part of, uh, you know, the Latino COVID initiative, which is kind of a statewide group of folks, elected local leaders, state leaders, federal leaders, and also healthcare professionals, social service agencies who have been looking at and studying that. Um, a lot of those folks are working. Uh, many have to provide for their families, and many of them, who, especially the ones who are undocumented, didn't qualify under the Federal CARES Act because of the current administration's a choice not to allow them to apply for a lot of the help. So one of the things that we did in the you know General Assembly is fought for a lot of funding to help give folks access. Um, we knew this early on, uh, the testing, and that's why the importance of testing and the expansion of testing uh, was very key for our, especially this district, because uh, we're seeing that. We're, we're seeing that. And, a lot. and you heard the president uh, today saying that some federal funding for testing sites too in Illinois will go away. Uh, do you anticipate the testing to remain uh, at the level it's at right now? Governor Pritzker has said he's going to continue funding uh, testing. I think that's very important. You know, let's not see what the foolishness is going on in the White House. It's working. It is important. Um, you are seeing it. Uh, and, and, and it's imperative for us to continue testing so we can actually see what's going on in our communities, where the hot spots are, where they're not. And especially when we're doing the reopening plan, testing is key for us to reopen safely. Obviously, we're going to go into phase four on Friday. Many of my district are excited about that, but there are also folks who are a little concerned. Some of them are still not ready. I mean, I've talked to a few. They're like, are we opening too quickly? You're looking at other states like Texas and Arizona that are seeing this huge uptick uh, in positive cases. Uh, my sister lives in Houston. She was talking to me about how the children's hospital is now taking adults because the regular hospitals are just overwhelmed with patients. So I think testing is important uh, so that way we can properly and safely reopen the state. Certainly the numbers show that uh, the, the nation as a whole is seeing its highest level of new coronavirus cases now in some very uh, scary situations in Texas and other places. Hospitals in Illinois doing uh, a lot better in terms of their capacity. So phase four reopening, at some point that will include casinos like the one behind us here, the Grand Victoria uh, on the river in Elgin. When is the casino going to reopen? I think right now we're waiting for the governor's guidance on that. At this point, stage, uh, you know, in phase four, that's not part of it. I know it's con constantly an ongoing discussions. I, I have been in discussions with not only uh, my casino, but other casinos as part of the Senate gaming working group that we had prior to returning to the General Assembly. And many of them are starting to put in place different uh, pr procedures uh, and ways so that way people can safely game. But, uh, you know, until it's safe for folks to go into the casino, it's not happening anytime soon. So you don't think it will be part of phase four at all? I don't know yet. I don't want to put words in the governor's mouth. So we keep in touch with, you know, you know, IDPH as well as DCEO who are help formulating those guidelines. Lines. I think that's where testing is very important again, you know, making sure we don't, as we start to reopen the economy in phase four, you know, we also don't want a huge uptick because then we're going to be back at the, the same problem we were early on, which was we don't want to flood our hospitals and our ICU beds. So we want to do everything safely. And I think as things are done safely, we'll go ahead and, and I'm, I'm sure the casino will reopen. All right, State Senator Christina Castro, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Paris, for coming to Elgin. Great to be here. And we'll be back with more from Elgin in just a bit. But first, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Paris, thanks. Uh, we'll see you in a bit. Up next, a report of alarming home lending practices in Chicago. There's a big difference between how much money is loaned to home buyers in majority white neighborhoods and how much is loaned in majority black and brown neighborhoods in Chicago. That's the subject of a recent report by City Bureau and WBEZ that analyzed home lending data from 2012 to 2018 in the city of Chicago. Joining us to discuss what they found are Andrew Fan, who reported this story for City Bureau, but is now a data reporter for the Invisible Institute, both of which are journalistic nonprofits, and WBEZ reporter Linda Lutton. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, Andrew, let's start with you, please. What, um, what can you tell us about the, the data that you examined and what you found? Yeah, um, so we, we examined some data called Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. It's called HUMDA data. And basically, every bank has to uh, report uh, every, every single loan it does that's, um, that involves housing. 
So actually, when you put all of those different submissions from all the different banks across the city, all the different you know other lenders across the city together, you end up with a really vivid picture of which neighborhoods are getting investment from banks and which aren't. And so what our analysis really showed is that there's a huge difference between the amount of money that's flowing into um, white neighborhoods versus black or, or, or Latinx neighborhoods. Um, for every dollar that goes into white neighborhoods, we, we saw that banks put in about 12 cents into black neighborhoods and about uh, 13 cents into Latinx neighborhoods. So there's a huge gap. And also some of the biggest banks in the city, like Chase Bank, um, actually had larger, um, larger gaps than most. So, so Chase Bank actually lent 40 times as much money uh, in white neighborhoods compared to black. And Andrew, as you're speaking, you know, we were showing our viewers a graphic showing that in white neighborhoods, uh, almost $40 billion was loaned in those neighborhoods compared to Latino neighborhoods, about $5 billion, and black neighborhoods, about $4.6 billion. Um, Andrew, you previously worked in the banking industry. You know, for your part, what was it that prompted this story for you? Yeah, that's really where this came from. Um, actually, so before I was a reporter, I worked at a, a small community development bank uh, called Urban Partnership on the south side of Chicago, so based in, in the neighborhood of Chatham. And what was really notable to me was I worked for a really small bank, you know, like a tiny, a tiny spec compared to some of the really big lenders like, um, you know, Chase Bank or Guaranteed Rate or Quicken. And one thing I noticed was in the neighborhoods we worked in on the south side, uh, we were one of the largest lenders when it came to a lot of different kinds of loans. If you wanted to, you know, buy an apartment building, we were one of the only lenders, you know, really big lenders in that in that in that market. And that always really struck me because I knew that we were small, and I didn't really understand where the other banks were. Um, so actually, one thing that happened was that, you know, later on in my time there, I ended up, you know, being the one responsible for filling out these reports, detailing all of our lending. And that's really what kicked kicked off for me that oh, I could use this to figure out, you know, if Chase Bank isn't here or if another bank isn't here, you know, where are they? And, and who was actually at lending here in this neighborhood alongside the bank that I was working for. And Linda, you found that during 2012 to 2018, more than two thirds of uh, the money loaned for housing purchases went to majority white neighborhoods in Chicago, as we've mentioned. Um, can you give us some more context on home lending in Chicago and explain why that might be the case? Yeah, there's, we heard several reasons and we talked to both folks on the ground. So folks in nonprofits, folks trying to promote home ownership, for instance, in black and Latino neighborhoods. And we also talked to academics and we heard a few things. Um, I guess the first thing we heard is just how important legacy is, how important the history is of lending in Chicago's neighborhoods. You know, in 1939, uh, the federal government made uh, redlining maps of Chicago and many other metropolitan uh, areas around the country. And those maps clearly drew red lines around neighborhoods that were considered dangerous to lend in. And uh, that definition was often uh, determined based on the race of the population living there. So black neighborhoods were redlined uh, and uh, oftentimes immigrant neighborhoods, certain types of immigrant neighborhoods were redlined as well. Uh, and, and, and banks really did not lend there. And as you go through sort of history, uh, you know, we heard again and again that dis disinvestment, it, it's layered over disinvestment. So once redlining became illegal, you had a history of disinvestment in those neighborhoods. You had lower values and you had simply less money sort of flowing in. Um, we also know that the end of uh, redlining, uh, sort of official redlining, you know, did not and redlining really. So we saw that. We're also, we also heard extensively from folks on the ground that banks are not offering the types of products that people in communities need. We heard, um, you know, decades of disinvestment has, have left, has left many properties in deep need of repair, but oftentimes folks wanting to buy properties there are unable to get loans because the properties need repair. So it's this sort of cyclical um, catch 22 where banks don't want to lend because there's too many repairs needed. Um, folks who want to buy can't can't get enough money to get the property. They Linda, can't buy because there's no, they, they need a loan that includes repairs. Right. That's often not included. And so Linda, where are some of these communities with these lower rates of home lending? Well, we saw lower rates of home lending and I'll say, dollars flowing into uh, black communities you've already mentioned um, and Latino communities. We see this across the board even, um, and I think this was a surprise to me, you know, we saw this even in communities that are sort of historically middle class. We saw in particular some of our largest lenders uh, avoiding those communities. You know, Chase Bank uh, 
was the second largest lender in terms of the overall dollars uh, given out in loans for the Chicago for Chicago uh, proper. But in our in our analysis over the seven year period we looked at, you know, Chase loaned an average of three made an average of three loans in Chatham, which is a historically middle class black community. So we really saw very stark differences. I mean, another that comes and, to mind, I think we saw a million dollars given in Inglewood and West Inglewood and nearly, oh, wow. you know, I want to say it was 800 million given in Lincoln Park in the same period of time. And of course, so you know, viewers can, piece. sorry to interrupt you, we're out of time, but of course viewers can find out more by visiting our website. In the meantime, I want to thank both of you, Linda Lutton and Andrew Fan, as always, outstanding reporting and journalism. Thank you. Thanks. And now we check back in with Paris Schutz, who's co-anchoring from Northwest Suburban Elgin, Paris. Yeah, Brandison, just a few hours ago, we spoke with Elgin's mayor, David Captain, amid some contentious protesting happening right outside city council because of a police-involved shooting here. We talked about that, but I began by asking the mayor whether or not Elgin was ready for phase four of reopening. Elgin's been ready for quite some time, and uh, we've had some you know, we've had some great conversations with people. Uh, obviously, there's people all over the map as to where that what they want to see, what they want to have happen uh, for a community. Uh, some wanted to open earlier, and we've been following the uh, state's uh, guidelines. We've stuck to them, and we're going to continue to do that. So it's been uh, I think it's worked out well for us. You know, we're a large city. I think one of the things that makes Elgin different than maybe many of the communities around us is that we're a minority city. We're over 50% minority. We are one of the fastest growing senior populations. So our population is very much at risk. And I'm very, I'm a senior myself, so I'm very much in tune to what's going on. My job is to make sure that people are safe and stay well. So I'm very cautious about how we're doing opening and we're going to continue to do that. Another part of your job is to deal with the issues of the day of police community relations. And as we tape, uh, we hear some <laughs> protesters in the background because you're about to go into a city council meeting. Yep. One of the things on their minds uh, is the, the, the police involved shooting uh, of an African American woman here a couple years ago on I-90 that was Lieutenant Chris Jensen involved in that shooting. Um, he has been reinstated to the police force. What can you say about that case? Well, he was uh, found uh, innocent by the uh, state's attorney in Chicago of no criminal charges, and we worked through the process. And he received what every, uh, what every citizen gets, his due process. We went all the way through uh, state police, the state's attorney in Chicago, and through uh, an independent uh, consultant that looked at our policies to make sure that he did not violate our policies. And he was found innocent of all those, and our chief chose to reinstate him. And it was deemed a justified shooting based upon the Elgin policy. That's correct. And you see the conversation around the, the country of, of defunding uh, police departments, of taking police officers out of public schools. You, you have the second largest school district in the state here in Elgin. You we do, yes. Yeah. Um, is Elgin taking up some of those policies? We're working on, we're, we're taking a close look at some of those things. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let me go through them uh, one at a time here, I guess. Uh, for one thing, uh, the school district U46 involves more communities in the city of Elgin. I think there are five or six. So they have their own issues. They pay for some of their police to go in as well. And uh, it's a determination that will be that will come from the uh, school district if they want to remove those uh, uh, officers from the, uh, uh, from the schools. As far as the city, as we look at uh, uh, defunding, you know, I think that's kind of a thing that needs a definition for us. And I've used the example in Elgin, and I've talked about this for four years, that the city of Elgin has started to, and our police officers have started to pick up some of the obligations of the state of Illinois because they quit funding uh, human services, they quit funding uh, drug rehab, they quit funding mental health, they quit funding homelessness. So the burden started to fall back on municipal municipalities to pick those things up. So our budget goes into those things. If you want to defund those things, somebody's going to have to pick it up at the uh, at the state and uh, federal level or so state and local uh, state level to do, take care of that. So state and federal level funding of those things and perhaps you can move more police resources back into sort of the bread and butter of police. Absolutely. And I you know, I've said that the days of uh, uh, police officers chasing the bad guy down the alley have have uh, 
pretty much diminished in Elgin for sure. And uh, we have uh, our, so our police officers uh, do social work. We have uh, uh, people set aside that do uh, work with the homeless. We have people that work with uh, mental illness as well and work, uh, been serving on drug task forces for a long time. So yeah, that, that job has expanded. And it's uh, uh, not because that we wanted to do that, it's because I think of need. And it's, you, uh, we can't let those people go uh, uh, without assistance. Something we've heard from public officials all across the region and from police and law enforcement officials too, that police have taken on too many duties, more than they used to. So Brandis, uh, that was our chat with Elgin Mayor David Captain. We'll be back with some spotlight in just a second. Yeah, Paris, you've also been hearing uh, the voices and the, the, the jingling of the protesters quite a bit uh, during your interview. Yeah. But then again, yeah. you know, just throughout the region, we've been hearing them. Thanks. We'll see you in a bit for Spotlight. Right. An arts alliance has been beautifying boarded up buildings downtown and throughout the city in a form of protest. Arts correspondent Angel Ito shares more on why the organization is painting the city. This piece is going to deal with what's going on in society, uh, you know, Black Lives Mattering, uh, riots and looting and all that stuff, but it's also going to have a piece of tranquility and a sense of there's going to be some peacefulness in it um, because that's what we kind of need. Uh, for sure, fight the good fight, but we also got to keep our spirits high too. That's one of the many goals of the art initiative Paint the City. Co-founder Barrett Keithley says they're using art as a way to respond to how the world is currently understanding racism. Our form of activism as artists is, you know, our platform and the businesses, by connecting the local artists to the local businesses, gives us that platform to, to say our piece and speak our, you know, speak volume. In every part of history, there's always been artists kind of like narrating that part of uh, history. For us, it's no different. Um, so we wanted to make sure that our voices were out here in a major way. Comprised of 75 artists who volunteer their time for free, co-founder Missy Perkins says they've painted boarded windows throughout the city since protests began. Why would you say that it's important for people to see this artwork downtown specifically? Downtown was obviously affected a lot with the protests and the riots. Um, and I think it's actually good and important that the businesses are here actually supporting the Black Lives Matter through that. You know, they're, they're, it's interesting to see that a lot of them do understand that a message, you know, needs to be sent and created. So when you're walking downtown and you see lions and tigers and exotic jungles, you're reminded of a bigger message the art that we're doing on these businesses I think kind of opens up for those conversations to happen and kind of peacefully happen to where people try and understand where each other is coming from. As the city enters phase four and more businesses begin to reopen, Paint the City hopes to take the boards down and display them in art galleries. The co-founders also want to encourage people to vote by turning the boards into voting booths around the city. Kind of like how the city has had the, uh, those, you know, the cows that were painted or the dogs that were painted. Um, we're going to do the same thing to kind of get people in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of getting motivated to vote this for this upcoming election. Mm -hmm. And that's another form of like protest and activism. It is. Another form of protest, another form of activism. But in the meantime, their primary goal remains the same. Our goal is to heal the city through art in all forms. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. As we mentioned, the artists are volunteering their time and supplies. That's why Paint the City is asking for donations to pay the artists in a current GoFundMe campaign. There's more information on that on our website. A contentious vote on discontinuing the Chicago Police Department contract with Chicago Public Schools, phase four of reopening starts Friday, and a plan for in-person instruction at schools in the fall. Here with all that and more is our Spotlight Politics team of Amanda Venicky, Paris Schutz, and Heather Sharon. Hello again, everybody. Hey. Hi. <laughs> um, Amanda, let's start with you. You know, we just heard from you about the uh, Chicago Board of Education voting on this contract uh, for police officers, SROs, in public schools. What's your biggest takeaway from what happened today? Ooh. 
Don't know if I can pick just one. I will say that first is going to be really keeping an eye on these local school councils because as I noted, you're going to have the board have to make a decision again to approve a new contract. And they said, well, maybe that will be a whole lot less than $33 million if you see local school councils saying, no, we don't want to have police in our individual schools. Also notable, I think, was the breakdown of the vote. As I noted, it was four to three. That also broke down via gender lines with the four men who are on the Board of Education voting to keep SROs with the women voting no. So that's a sort of interesting breakdown. And also you're seeing the Chicago Teachers Union disappointed in this result, saying that this goes to show why something else that they have long been calling for needs to happen, and that is an elected school board in Chicago. Yeah, uh, the, I'm, I'm interested you know, to hear as more comes out about this, Amanda. Um, Heather, there was also an ordinance on this very issue in city council last week. Um, let's hear what Alderman Carlos Ramirez Rosa said today at the Chicago Board of Education meeting. I urge the Chicago Board of Education today uh, to vote to end this contract and please note that this fight is not going anywhere. We have introduced an ordinance in the Chicago City Council to uh, terminate this contract on the city's end. Uh, this has tens of thousands of parents that support this. Uh, they wanna see it get done. We're gonna continue to fight to get this done because we have to stand up and do what's right for our children. So Heather, what are aldermen doing now? Well, uh, that ordinance is still mired in legislative limbo, so there won't be a vote on that anytime soon. But the next date to keep an eye on is July 2nd, when a joint session of the City Council's Education and Public Safety Committee meetings will look at a two-year-old audit by the city's watchdog that found serious and significant problems with the school resource officer program. And he found that it was more likely than not to actually sort of push teenagers and students into sort of the criminal justice system then help keep them out of it. So there will be a lot of discussion about that audit. And I expect Alderman will once again try to sort of force a vote to end the contract from the city council side. But Amanda is exactly right. This is a battle that could end up being fought local school council by local school council uh, just before the start of school in the fall. And, and Paris, you know, the Chicago Teachers Union, of course, they're very vocal and they've been vocal on this, this issue as well. Isn't this about safety in schools? What are they saying? Well, the, they say that real safety in schools right now is having that money, that $32 million contract diverted for COVID-19 safety. Plus, they also note the fact that there have been tense situations between some police in schools and students, a student who was tased and dragged down the stairs. At the same time, the Chicago Teachers Union in recent years has tried to assert itself as the political organization in the city when it comes to sort of that democratic socialist space. Uh, they backed Tony Preckwinkle for mayor, although she lost to Lori Lightfoot. So they've tried to assert their political power, and this issue right now is front and center uh, in, in that sort of democratic socialist space, so the teachers union is all over it. Absolutely, and we'll be hearing more about it. Um, moving on to following up on something that Heather has been reporting on, you did some digging um, and found that the dispersal orders that police are issuing with regard to the stay-at-home order uh, to people congregating in large-ish groups were distributed disproportionately. Heather, tell us what you found. That's right. So if you cast your memory back to the months of late March, April, and May, we were all supposed to be staying home to avoid helping to spread the coronavirus. And Mayor Lightfoot had faced criticism that those orders were being enforced more robustly um, in Black and Latino neighborhoods of Chicago. So I asked the police department to send me the data, and I dug into it and found that nearly half of all of the dispersal orders were issued in three West Side police district and those police districts are among the most violent in Chicago uh, and the mayor says that that was due to the fact that there were more calls for service for to disperse large gatherings in those areas but it certainly raises additional questions about whether Chicago is policed equitably um, when in, you're looking at white neighborhoods some of some of which only saw four dispersal orders Four. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah. So Paris, you know, the city's also seen, you know, a very violent couple of weekends as of late. You've been on the ground in neighborhoods all over Chicago, outside Chicago tonight. You're in Elgin. Um, give us some perspective on this violence. 
Well, this is what community groups had been fearing for many months. And by the way, we've been in many of the neighborhoods that have seen some of the highest rates of violence in the last few weeks. They worried that as the summer months approached, you, you add Chicago's historic problems with inequities and, uh, and poverty in certain neighborhoods with the COVID-19 shutdown, with such a high rate of unemployment in many black and brown communities, with the high mental health problems, stress that comes with this, kids home from school, not able to go to after school programs or summer programs. And it's a cauldron that everybody feared would cause exactly what's happening right now, which is a higher rate of gun violence. So add all that on top of disinvestment that's going on for decades, which you talked about. Uh, add that onto the easy way that a lot of folks can access illegal guns through straw purchasing in these communities. And, you know, this issue gets politicized, unfortunately. I caution people not to jump to a very simple conclusion about this because there are no simple answers. There are a lot of factors that are leading to this. Hopefully, uh, police and the city can get a handle on this, but this yeah. is what people were, were fearing. Yeah, well said that there are no simple answers. Um, reopening, we're approaching that in just a couple of days. Heather, the mayor is expanding outdoor dining for even more neighborhoods. Tell us what's going on there. That's right. So she said today that the first three expanded outdoor dining areas where they shut down streets on the Gold Coast and in Lakeview um, and in the heart of Italy neighborhood had been an emphatic success. So the program will expand to five more Chicago neighborhoods, including Edison Park and Grand Crossing. And this is really designed to throw restaurants and, and now bars a lifeline since they've been closed since mid-March and are really struggling to sort of get back on their feet. Uh, on Friday, indoor dining will start to be allowed at no more than 50 people or 25% of the, the restaurant's capacity. So uh, things are ramping up slowly and we may see increased uh, allowances um, if the number of cases of coronavirus continue to decline in Illinois and Chicago. Meanwhile, uh, you know, also reopening museums, the 606 tra six trail, uh, the lakefront path. A lot of residents, of course, have been looking forward to getting back on both of those. Um, but as Illinois coronavirus numbers are down, it's spiking in other parts of the country. Um, here's what Mayor Lori Lightfoot said uh, about if numbers should go up here again. We've been following these surges in other cases with great concern. And if it happens here, we will not hesitate to take the necessary steps to keep COVID-19 from rapidly spreading here again. And such steps include moving us back to phase three. Paris, you know, quickly, if you can, what happens if things shut down? Yeah. Well, I think re retailers, by the way, medical people we talked to are all monitoring this and concerned about this too. What I'll say about retailers is they're very concerned that they get shut down in months like November and December, which is where they make the lion's share of their money because of the holiday season. So if you have to be shut down, the spring isn't the worst time to do it. Well, there is no good time, but they're saying game over for retail if, if it happens in the fall. They're very concerned about that. Okay. Um, and Amanda, really quickly, you know, the governor released a plan for uh, schools. 20 seconds. What can parents expect? Parents can expect, evidently, to send their children back to the classroom. That said, there's a whole lot of hesitancy. It's rare, while CTU and the mayor continually butt heads, you don't see a whole lot of union pushback for Governor J.B. Pritzker, and yet that is what we are seeing. So it could look a bit different, even if they're going back to the classrooms, perhaps not every day. There's a plan for remote blended learning. We're going to be following that too, Brandis. Okay, my thanks to Amanda Vinicky, Paris Schutz, and Heather Sharon, our Spotlight Politics team. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And you can read more on the school board's vote and several other of our political stories on our website. That's at WTTW.com news. A talented band of Chicago teenagers recorded a new album during the pandemic. Expectations are high because their 2017 debut recording earned a Latin Grammy nomination. Arts producer Mark Vitale met Mariachi Herencia on a rooftop in Pilsen. Three, four. Mariachi music is something that we learned and earned from our ancestors, our grandparents, our parents, something that we are trying to bring back. Si 
Mariachi consists of pride for Mexico. We are trying to connect to our roots. We are playing this wonderful, beautiful musical tradition from Mexico. And really what we're doing is that we are sharing this beautiful culture with the world. We met just a small portion of the group, which has 18 members, and music transforms every one of them. And it showed me how to be a team player. It showed me a different side of myself. Most band members went through Chicago Public Schools' Mariachi Heritage Program, which we featured on Chicago Tonight in 2016. Más corto, más corto. Pa, 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 pa. Mariachi Herencia made their new recording with remote assistance from an elder mariachi master quarantined in Mexico City. Unfortunately, uh, Don Rigoberto Alfaro, which is our arrangement composer as well as our musical director, was unable to come because of the certain uh, circumstances that are happening right now as we speak. And we had a challenge. So I was given the amazing opportunity to musically guide uh, my compañeros to get this album done and send it out to the world for everyone's enjoyment. The clothing they wear is very much part of the tradition. It is like a way we show our pride towards what we play, which is mariachi music. It's the image of mariachi, really. This is the, what defines like the look of it. Their family members definitely approve. They're very proud of me because they see that I'm one of the only women in my family that was able to do this. And they see me as like someone that can be something in the world. It's a wonderful feeling really to get uh, kids and people from our generation to enjoy what is this beautiful genre of mariachi music. And not only that, but to also appeal to our parents and grandparents' generations as people who come from Mexico and people who come from hard times, but also kept this beautiful tradition, this beautiful genre of music with them as they came to the United States. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The new album from Mariachi Herencia is called Esencia, Volume 2. Find out more and see more of the band's performance on our website. Plus, you can hear the group perform and be interviewed on our sister station, WFMT, Saturday morning at 11. That's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also catch the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. That's right. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman, and there's a train, Paris. There's our train just on cue <laughs> at the end of the Metro line here. I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm whose pro bono work kept open a church shelter for the homeless in Chicago's southern suburbs.